We have all heard the phrase that it is more blessed to give than to receive, and I have heard this oft repeated, such that I'm not sure we always remember where this comes from. It is in one of uh, Paul's sermons, as he quotes Jesus, he says, In all of this I have given you an example, that by such work we must support the weak. Remembering the words of the Lord Jesus, for him, he himself said it is more blessed to give than to receive. And that is what we do believe about giving and receiving, and yet we must be honest with ourselves, and there are some challenges to being able to practice generous, uh, generosity, generosity in, in giving. Two of the more common challenges are fear, fear that if I am generous with what I have, there will not be enough, I'll just run out. And so I, I hold on to as much as possible. And fear is a hard thing to grapple with because fear is contagious and fast moving and, and it rubs off easily. So fear and the second challenge is the grappling with self-gratification. If I give generously, will I have enough to satisfy myself, to get what I think I need to have to be happy? And so when generosity is a risk to my own happiness, well, maybe I won't be quite so generous. And so how do we handle these two? How do we practice being this is more blessed to give than to, than to receive? How do we handle the, the challenges to that? The answer is one that I'm not sure is all that much of a surprise, but to follow Jesus methodically day by day. To, to follow Jesus consistently turning to, to follow him, and, and to do so as a conscious way of life. Like There's the first time we choose to follow Jesus, a, a good thing, but then every day thereafter we, we have a s choices that we make. I will choose to follow Jesus in this mo moment or, or not. Right? This is part of the reason we, we pray this Wesley and covenant prayer at the beginning of every year as we did this year to, to remind ourselves that we, we are choosing to follow Jesus whatever the implications might be the, that prayer we prayed as you might remember I am no longer my own but thine put me to what thou wilt rank me with whom thou wilt put me to doing put me to suffering let me be employed by thee or laid aside for thee exalted for thee or brought low for thee let me be full let me be empty let me have all things let me have nothing i freely and heartily yield all things to thy pleasure and disposal and now O glorious and blessed god father son and holy spirit thou art mine and i am thine so be it in the covenant which i have made on earth let it be ratified in heaven like to say to pray, preach a prayer like that the first time I to, to pray a prayer like that the first time I, I I prayed that I was going to my first appointment and it did catch me up short like how to trust God uh, to, to be able to live generously with my life that's whew, right. And to do this, it's not to say that as we follow Jesus daily, temptation stops. If you look at Jesus, we see when Jesus goes into the desert, he is tempted. And fully human, fully God, perfect, right? And so if he is tempted, it's not to say we will ever not be tempted. What, to see, what we see is the way that Jesus responds to temptation. When Jesus is tempted, he responds by focusing on something bigger, something more important. It is not that the temptation doesn't strike, it's that he is focused on something more important, and he just ha doesn't have the time for that thing, because I've got, I've got something to do, right? You, you, talk, you meet someone who's on a mission, and they just can't be distracted, and, and that is the, the call that we realize that we can fo follow, right? We, we can be called to live a generous life, and, and to just not wave away the, the temptations. And I think one of the ways that helps me practice this and experience this is, is coming to communion. Every time we have communion, it is an experience of abundance. Every time we gather for a meal, there is always enough. Right? The problem at Methodist gatherings for meals is not, are, is there enough to eat? It's who has to take home the leftovers. Right? On March 17th, we're going to get together for corned beef. 50 pounds of corned beef has been ordered. There will be plenty. Right? I'm not worried about that. Right? To, and the uh, practice of abundance, to practice, we practice it every single time we come to this table, every t single time we gather together. And, and it is by practicing this day after day after day that we begin to believe it that we begin to lean on it, we begin to believe, such that when fear does crop up, we can say, you know, I could go give it to fear, but I've been living day by day in the abundance that God provides. I don't, I don't need to be afraid. I've got something 
to hold on to. Right? And, and communion is, is not just the experience of having abundance. Communion is the experience of knowing that someone else's gratification matters as well. Like my generosity for others matters because if I come to communion and if I come to, the, when I come to this table by myself in, in the middle of the week, is it communion? I mean, even if I ate my lunch on the, I, I, I wouldn't, but even if I put out my own lunch on this table, set up, put out some ramen, am I eating communion? No, I'm having lunch, because I'm not having communion unless I'm with the community, right? Communion without community is just a light snack, right? Communion is the way that we are connected to each other, to be reminded that each other's gratification and needs matter. And so as day by day we follow Jesus, as day by day we, we turn to him, we begin to believe and practice till it sinks in. That, as Jesus says in Matthew 16, that if we seek to save our lives, if we seek to put our lives first, if we live a life where we are at the center of the, our own world, that in the end that life is a life that is lost. That in following Jesus we give of our lives and we find a true life, a life that is worth living. A life that is based upon the practice of generosity. Right? And this practice of generosity, it is the root of all worship. If you go back into the beginning of the scriptures, how, how do the Hebrew people learn to worship? What's the first thing they do? It's not pray, it's not sing, it's not preach. It's to offer, it's to be generous, it's to give of the first fruits to say thank you. The generous giving is the way that the Hebrew people learn to, to worship. And I think we lose track of how hard that would be to, give, to be, give generously to God of the first fruits. Because we have apples all year round, don't we? Right? Can you imagine going months and months and months and months without fresh fruit? And you get the first fruit. And you're looking at it and it is ripe and it is golden. And you're waiting for it. And you take it and you give it. And you don't eat it yourself. Right, what an amazing act of generosity. That, that is how the Hebrew people learn to worship in the beginning. It is the most common form of worship in all of Scripture. And it's this giving that builds and sustains the relationship between God and God's people in the same way that a five-year-old gives a gift to a parent at Christmas for the first time. Do you remember the first gifts that your children give you at Christmas? All right? If you look at the balance sheet of like the total aggregate value of your family, has it gone up in that exchange? Because what, what happened? You gave them 10 bucks, and then they bought something and they gave it back to you, right? You, you haven't actually increased your aggregate value. Right? If, if you look at it like that, you're missing the point. It's a relational thing. They have wrought something and given it back to you. My, I watched my dad tell uh, my family about one of the first gifts I gave them. It was a cookie about that tall made into a Christmas ornament. It was a Christmas tree ornament. And, and then they gave it, and I gave it to my parents, and then I evidently took a bite of it. <laughs> and so they lacquered it so that I wouldn't eat it some more. And then they stored it, and they got it out the next year, and I took another bite. And so we learned a very important lesson. It takes two coats of lacquer to keep Andy from eating a cookie. <laughs> That's a very important thing for us to know because my son is inheriting some of my tendencies. <laughs> right? it's, that's not about the money. It's not about the assets. It's about the relational giving, right? But I gave something to my parents and to watch my dad tell that story, it was, he took more joy in that than anything I think I've given him since. As we understand this, we begin to understand the nature of generosity, that all that we have belongs to God. Like As we offer to God, it's not like we're offering God and God's going, well, I did need that extra little bit to get me ahead. I wasn't sure I was going to get through the end of the month, right? It's like my dad taking, receiving a gift that I immediately take a bite out of, right? It's like giving like a child to a parent. It's a relational moment for everything we have is God's in the first place. We are not owners but stewards entrusted with this beautiful world. And, and to give to God is, is, is to handle it well. In Genesis 1.28, the command God gives all of humanity is go forth and prosper. And I've entrusted you with this world, so do good by it. Right? Handle it well. As the Hebrew people enter the promised land, they're reminded of this. They're reminded, it's in Leviticus, uh, and they're told the land, it cannot be sold permanently because the land is mine. You're my tenants, right? Don't lose track of that. 
It's my land. It is my gift to you that you can live on it. God's desire for how we use the land, how we use all we've been entrusted with, is to be able to be generous with each other, to be generous towards God and each other, to, to be participating in God's purposes, God's hopes and dreams. Now, the practicality of how this works some of you have heard the word tithe before, the idea of giving 10% of income, and people have asked me, do I have to tithe? And the honest answer is no. You do not have to. Right? You don't have to do anything. You don't have to do any. You don't have to because everything you have is given as a gift. Like I don't have to tithe. Because I'm here. I am forgiven and accepted and loved as a gift. And so anything I do is not because I have to. It's because we handle gifts with care. Right? If if you are given a gift, how do you handle a gift? You accept it and you care for that gift because it is precious. Right? And, and we are given these gifts and there is some guidance in Scripture about how to handle the gifts we have been given. And, and yes, uh, Abraham did give 10% as a way of, of saying thank you. But the tithe, it's an option for how to approach being generous. The point is to cultivate generosity. Whether you give 10% of, of money or give 10% of time or give 10 something else or, or 5% or 15%, whatever it is, the point is to participate in being generous because God is generous and we are made in the image of God and we are meant to be generous as well. There's no requirement on what to do with this gift. Just be generous. Right? The, the tithe is neither a ceiling nor a floor for how we give. There are people who I know who will never be able to tithe. There are people I know who have been giving above and beyond the tithe for years. Uh, there are people I know who give 10% to the church and then give another 5-6% to other activities outside the church that they believe make Jesus smile. All right? The point is to cultivate the generosity. Whatever the decision is made, and I hope each of us ta has taken the time or will take the time to decide how to be generous on a consistent basis, the point is to cultivate that generosity so that we are going to live as we are meant to live instead of turning into Scrooge. Because the guy from the Christmas Carol, Scrooge, bah humbug, like, he's not a real person, but yet he really is. Right? To turn inwards and to focus on yourself, you turn into Scrooge over time. And the, the miracle is that people can change. The shame is that it takes more than one night. It takes a lifetime. Right? As we find the joy of giving, we find that what Jesus says to, is true. That when giving of ourselves, Jesus talks about how when we give, we find ourselves full with a good measure packed down and overflowing. Such that what we have is a bounty that can be shared and a community that can be gathered as feasting happens. And so that we can practice generosity with as many people as possible. And if you need to look at an example of what generosity can do in a person's life... Look at the story of Zacchaeus, Luke 19. They could change a person's life. Let me close by eating a cookie, which I happen to have right here. I know, and right in front of the kids, too. I'm sorry. You all know where these cookies come from, right? Oh, Walmart. They have cotton candy flavored frosting now. I love these. I did not discover these till I went to college. Mm, such a shame. Because these things are great. Have you, who, who here has had these cookies? Oh, man. You know, if you have one cookie, that's good. What's better than one, one cookie is a second cookie. But the challenge is, what if I have a whole case of cookies? Can I eat them all before they go stale? Probably not. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Should I? <laughs> if I eat all, I can eat them all quickly, but if I eat like all of these today, it's not going to be good. I'm going to pay for it. I'd be reminded I'm not 20 anymore. And so I could eat them all. I could like freeze them and hoard them and, and try to hold on to them at all costs. But you all know how Walmart is. Have I, I've never walked into Walmart when they haven't had a display of these cookies. You, you all notice that? These cookies are always there. I can hoard them, but there are always going to be more of them. So what's the best thing to do with baked goods? Share them. 
it works out very well for you that Walmart keeps a very big supply. My friends, to live a good life is to live with a profound sense that we have enough, right? To cultivate gratitude, to get wrapped up in something bigger than ourselves, to live beneath our means, and then to be able to be generous. And how do we know if, it's wor if that's working out for us? Well, then here's a simple way to test. Do you have a cookie to eat? And do you have people to share your cookies with? If so, you are indeed living a pretty good life. Thanks be to God. Amen.